Hi, my name is Jacob Redding. I'm here today to talk to you about sustainable open source. My career in technology is pretty wide ranging. I've been a network and a system administrator. I've been a technical architect and I have and I still do run software development teams. I've contributed to a number of open source projects over the years. Early on, it was a project called Jetbox, which is an open source CMS gallery, which had image slideshows with PHP. I contributed to JavaScript packages, but I spent most of my time within the Drupal open source project. Working with a great group of individuals, I was one of our founding board members and the first executive director of the Drupal Association, which was our nonprofit that we started to help sustain the Drupal project. And through sustain, we mean uh, funding the infrastructure that runs Drupal.org and the code repositories, the disaster recovery systems, as well as running our physical infrastructure, we also ran our human infrastructure, helping to support meetups and events, conferences, etc. Whatever we could do to help grow the project and sustain it and grow it from a handful of developers to now we have well over 30,000 active developers contributing every single year. And through that experience, I've noticed that we do have problems within open source. And one of our most notable problems is that a lot of people are using open source, but not everyone is participating or contributing to the sustainability of open source. And this is a problem because open source must be nurtured. Open source and all software is not static. It is a living being. When you release code out there, you don't just leave it alone. It has to be updated for the latest operating system, language, or framework upgrade. You should be responding to feature requests or functionality enhancements, bug reports, and security issues. So open source, like all software, has to be nurtured. Now, in the open source community, we did learn the hard way of what happens if you're not nurturing it or don't have a big enough community. OpenSSL in 2014 had one of its largest exploits. There was a vulnerability in it that exposed a buffer overread that stemmed from an unchecked input variable. And at this point, a lot of very large companies were using this software. Yahoo, Stack Overflow, Amazon Web Services, Bitbucket, Akamai, SoundCloud, Tumblr, and more were all using it. These are multi-billion dollar companies that were encrypting millions of dollars in transactions every single day. And it slipped by all of them, despite the code being open and transparent for all to see. And I don't think the problem was that there was a bug in the software. I think all software has bugs. It's how we respond to that, which is the important piece. And then in this case, I think the problem was that OpenSSL had only $2,000 that year in donations to be used for the maintenance and nurturing of the software. And that's just not enough money. And yes, there were some side things that they were doing. Yes, they had chargeable work and support contracts, but there were not enough of these large companies looking at the full stack to understand everything they were using. Dries, the founder of Drupal, has written a great blog post about this called Makers and Takers. And in this presentation, I'm going to use some of those concepts. So I encourage you to uh, search for this blog post that Dries has written. And makers in this case are those that are creating the software, writing the documentation, participating in the marketing, and doing anything they can to make sure that that project is sustainable and growing. And the takers are on the other side, they're simply using. That's all they're doing. And I think in the case of OpenSSL at this time, that imbalance was highlighted. There were many takers than there were makers. Way too many on the take side. I see this as a stage of contribution. I think anybody who gets involved or starts using open source goes through a progression. They first become aware of a project and they start to use it. And they might learn where the community gathers. 
Then they participate by submitting questions in. They could be in the forums or they're submitting requests for a new feature or enhancement or maybe even a bug request. Then hopefully they jump to the other side and they start contributing. Instead of just submitting a bug report, they contribute the code to fix that bug or they write some documentation or they assist others in the forum or they financially contribute. And then they progress further and they become engaged. They submit major changes. They become, they take on a leadership role. They assist in the documentation, the marketing, etc. cetera. They, they get engaged in that project. And this could be an individual or it could be a team at a company. Either, I think it's the same progression. And I think right now our balancing act between those that are aware and slightly participating and those that are contributing and engaged is off. The makers and takers is not balanced. There are too many people just using and submitting in than there are contributing or being engaged. I think we have another problem that is growing and we're going to see it grow over the years and it's with package managers. Package managers are great and they're wonderful and they allow us to easily create new software. NPM, um, PIP, Ruby on Rails, they've created these wonderful infrastructures that allow us to like, quickly just grab a bunch of code, put it in and like just get to the point. It's wonderful. But I think that the ubiquity of these package managers is leading us to some obscurity of where the software is coming from. Because in one line within a Python uh, script, I could just add in a library that is, I don't know, a thousand or 10,000 or a hundred or a hundred thousand lines of code. I might not know. And I might not also know how many people is it taking to maintain that library. If I write a Python script and I include scikit, is that one person or a hundred people? Who is testing that software? Who's testing that library, right? So this ubiquity of these package managers is leading us to obscure where all of this code comes from. Now, the background on my slide is also something that's more a little bit more non-software in the real world. It's toilet paper. Toilet paper last year was ubiquitous. It was absolutely everywhere hotels, restaurants, the store, etc. And it took a pandemic and all the toilet paper went away for us to realize that we had a supply chain problem where it was highly dependent upon the demand and we didn't really understand where everything is. And all the toilet paper all of a sudden went, went away. And I think with software, we kind of have the same thing. Right now, we rely upon these packet managers and it's just sort of magic and it's there but one day it might not be if we're not paying attention to the sustainability of this. Now, I want to recognize that we've made a lot of strides in this area. The Linux Foundation formed the core infrastructure initiative. GitHub introduced contribution stars and Open Collective and Tidelift were created to add direct funding to open source projects by reviewing the entire stack. These initiatives are working and they are moving us forward, but they're not enough. Open source is growing rapidly and extending into more industries and more areas. So we're going to need to change the culture and structure of every industry. So I'm looking to other industries, for example, so how do they sustain their industry? And the fishing industry here is one of the biggest industries there that needs sustainability. There's only so many bodies of water and there's only so many fish in the sea. And we have to collaborate on a global scale with all the fisheries in every country and every boat owner to create sustainability within the fishing industry. Otherwise, as technology advances, we will literally take all the fish out of the ocean. And we recognize that decades ago, and created initiatives to make that industry more sustainable. And I'm not saying they're perfect, nothing is, but they're doing a better job every single year. And there's a number of other bodies that we can look to. 
So within fishing, it's the Marine Stewardship Council or MSC. There's us certification, the Rainforest Alliance, the Fair Trade Group. There's brands like Tony's Chocoloni, which looks at their entire uh, supply chain. So they know not just where they get their, their cocoa powder or their cocoa butter, but where those uh, cocoa pods come from and where the farmers are and where they have planted their seeds. So then they know that the entire supply chain from farmer to bar is sustainable and that the money is going to the right place. Similar with Rainforest Alliance and Fair Trade and us, etc. They're focused on the sustainability of the full supply chain. And I believe in the open source world, we need to do something similar. So if we look at the vision and mission of MSC, their vision is they want to see the world's ocean teeming with life and that Sisu supplies are safeguarded for future generations. And they do that through the eco label and fishery certification. So I want to do something similar. I want us to create the sustainable open source certification or SOS. It's certified, put a stamp on it. We're going to create sustainable open source. The vision and mission statement of this program would be to create a vibrant software ecosystem that pushes the boundaries of innovation while maintaining full stack sustainability, reliability, and safeguarding this for future generations. And we're going to do it in a similar way. We'll create an SOS label and a certification program. And the goal would be to influence the choices that companies make when hiring development agencies and working with our partners to transform the software industry. Because we need balance in this world. We need a balance between those that make the software and those that take the software. So we need to focus on those that are taking the software so that they work with those that make the software. That creates our balance. In other certification programs, they do that by focusing on the consumers, not the creators, but the consumers. And Open Collective and Tidelift are doing that. I think we need to do that to a much grander scale. So who would lead this? I think the open source initiative should lead this. Or, and or, B corporations should lead this. The B corporation certification program could add in open source sustainability as part of its program so that you can become a B Corp if you're also helping to sustain open source. And this is partially already being done. Etsy is a B Corp. Hootsuite is a B Corp. Warby Parker is a B Corp. And each of these have really great technology teams that do participate in open source. And that has led to them becoming a certified B Corp. And B Corps are not for smaller companies, not saying that Etsy or Hootsuite is a small company, they're pretty big. But Danon is a gargantuan company, it's one of the largest companies in the world, and they're also a certified B Corp. So we can target small and very large organizations through the B Corp program. If we can convince them that open source sustainability and backing your stack is something that they need to incorporate in the B Corp. Or they should work with the open source initiative and marry these two so that you get OSI certified as part of your B Corp program. So how do we do this? I think Whoever leads this needs to do targeted marketing to educate and inform consumers, not makers, the takers of open source software, that they need to work with certified sustainable open source software companies. I want to see it within RFPs that the RFP requests a certification status, that preference is given to certified agencies, that those who are paying for software to be built or who are building software development teams or who are creating budgets and they're forward looking in their budgets that they should be looking at how the sustainability of their software is created. And the way it could be created is by looking at a certification. 
Is their team certified as sustainable? Is the agency they're working with certified as being a sustainable organization? Similar to how we look at a chocolate bar for us, fair trade or buy our coffee from fair trade. Or when we go to a, a restaurant, we get MSC certified fish. We need to do this in a similar way. We need to knock out the players in the market that are not focused on sustainability. If they're just using software and reselling it, we need to knock them out by getting them into a certification program, which means getting them into sustainable practices. So who gets certified? All right, this is where it's going to get messy. The devil's in the details. In fact, the devil's right here on the slide. You can see him. But we've built bigger things in open source, and I'm confident we can get through this one. So my first target would be any members of Open Collective and Tidelift. They're most likely solid contributors to open source, and they care about the sustainability of the software they're using. So they would be easy targets to be certified. I also think we should collaborate with GitLab, GitHub, and others, as well as packet managers to traverse who's using the software and if they're contributing back to it. The data is there. It's not easy, it's not perfect, but we can do some correlations. It's one of many metrics we can use. If your company is downloading a lot for GitHub or has put it as part of a dependency package and you can see it on a consistent basis during your build processes that you're pulling from an open source project, but that company is never participating in it and that happens over and over again, that's an audit trail that could be used as one of many metrics to say you either are part of the sustainability of open source or you are not. I think we also need to learn from B Corps, where there's a self-assessment that is up for review by the organization, and then there's audit rights. So the company is given a checklist of what makes you sustainable. They do a self-assessment and they submit that up for a review. This could be where the open source initiative steps in and does that review. And upon that review of the company self-assessment, they issue a certification or a non-certification, but they reserve the right to do an actual audit. And that audit could be of GitHub contributions or GitLab, or do they have a Tidelist subscription or open collective subscription? Are they financially contributing? Are they involved in the marketing, the decision-making, the leadership, etc.? I think we can do this and we have precedent out there in other industries. I would like us to bring it into this industry, into open source. And with that, I thank you for your time. And if you have any questions, I'll be right here. I want to take the burden off the makers and to and put it on the takers. Um, so the question was, the sellers of software, SaaS providers, and integrators. Yep. Anybody who's like building software to be sold in some form. Um, and then, you know, they they have an audience of either individuals or companies and those companies and individuals um, are the ones that would be requesting it. Like, I only want to work with sustainable software developers. You know, I want to work with developers that are really focused at. And this is starting to happen. Like, um, um, Mike Lamb over at Pfizer, he's got some presentations online that you can Google. And he, he puts that in his RFPs. So when he's hiring uh, companies, he's like, tell me your open source um, strategy. Um, I work for Accenture and I've received those RFPs from certain companies where in the RFP, it's like, you know, tell us how many people you have, how many certified, your skill levels. And one of them is tell us about your open source contributions. And so being the open source guy at Accenture of, of many people, there's a, a decent sized team here, we're constantly looking at and pulling that evidence and showing what we're doing. And it's pushed this company to, to change. I just want to do that on a very large scale. The one's being typed out here. The Sustain OSS, we did bring this up at Sustain OSS. Um, we're in Belgium, I think. I was, I was there <laughs> before all the pandemic has changed time and space for me. 
Um, so uh, it was brought up, uh, but not to this level, I don't think. So the third question is, have I thought about what the certifications would look like? Um, to some extent, not every detail, it's going to be messy. But I largely look to B Corps and, and, and a little bit to MSC, um, the, the Marine Stewardship Council. Um, and the reason I look at these two versus like fair trade, organic, or others, um, one, if we look at B Corps, they're looking at the financial status and, and community involvement and engagement to create sustainability in business practices. So if you look at the B Corp, like what they're looking at, it really is heavily focused on sustainability of business, ecosystem, integrated with the community where they're at. Uh, and so there's lots of metrics on that and some of them are very subjective. Very few of them are, are objective, um, but they're, you know, they're, they're very uh, holistic. And the machine, Marine Stewardship Council, while it's not perfect, they have to focus on a global initiative through government regulations, through government changes, and not just be like, hey, here's a little label you put on your fish, but they're, they're changing the entire supply chain. And they have to do that worldwide, and it's heavily political, and lots of regulations, and is it international honors or not, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so they've thought through a lot of this over decades. So a lot of things that we'll run into in terms of, well, there are government regulations and there are changes, they largely figured those out and there's a lot we can learn from there and bring them over. So when I think of what it looks like, these are the two models, B Corp and MSC. I think we marry those things up and I think we have something pretty close. And um, then we refine it and find bugs and <laughs> and do what we do in open source. We take an idea and then we make it better. Okay, so number four is a really good question. For it to be adopted, how can we create a demand for the organizations? This is the absolute critical piece. Uh, and I think I only had like a slide on it, maybe two. Um, but I one, am 100% there. The demand has to come from the buyers, the consumers. Uh, and that's what I'm saying is we create that demand is it's a heavy marketing campaign. You want to go out and you want to convince people that if they're hiring a software development agency or creative agency, and they're not asking them for their open source sustainability, then they're, they, they're making a risky financial decision. And that's just gonna take marketing. Um, you know, if you look at how Amazon or Microsoft or others do their, their, their marketing for why do you hire a certified Microsoft developer or why do you hire a certified, you know, Amazon architect? I mean, that's, that's, that's straight, that's basically it. It's, if you don't do this, you're taking a financial risk because you don't know the person on the other end. And we need to do the same thing. So I look at the OSI that way and think maybe this is where OSI shifts some focus and goes straight after consumers and says, and convinces them to only hire those that are being part of the open source cycle. And if they don't, then that's a risk that they shouldn't be taking. But it, it's it's just sort of like, uh, I, I think it's just pure marketing to be to be honest. That's about big blue button. <laughs> I thought it was like, like confusing. I was like, oh, the whole thing's confusing of this. I think we can still do it though. It's get building the certification will be confusing. It's not gonna be perfect straightforward. And I also, to be very honest with the people in the room and the recording, I mean, this is gonna take the better part of a decade. It's it's not gonna, this is nothing we're gonna create tomorrow and, and, and push out there. You know, Microsoft's been doing their certification program for 30, 40 years, but I mean, at this point, you know, they've convinced their market that no, you hire certified, you know, you hire in their partner ecosystem, you hire Microsoft certified people, Amazon's doing it, Google's doing it. Like it's a, it's a not an uncommon thing. And MSC has been doing it for decades. Like this is a long-term view that has to be, you know, started. And then there's a, a big sort of pressure campaign that lasts years. Rich, regards of the slides, I'm happy to put them, but I think the uh, State of the Source conference has a whole program of posting these and, and putting them. So, um, if you have shared them with us, uh, we'll attach them to the session listing on Eventier. If you haven't, send them to us, okay. um, and we'll get those linked up there. And then post event, there will be um, you know recordings of all of this with uh, slides and stuff again. So if you wanted to watch there, cool.
I notice above that Josh says that this sounds like a great initiative to explore through an OSI working group. <laughs> I mean, I'm happy to chat anybody's ear off about this. <laughs> I talk about this a lot. We've got a couple of volunteers in the chat, so make sure you check and see who those those individuals are. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a like a working group, but I do, I do think it's a it's a concerted effort that would take years. Getting B Corp off the ground took many, many, many years. And um, I, I think I, the last like a blog post I read about it, which was a few years ago, it was somewhere between 10 and $15 million just to, to, to really get traction um, in staff and in marketing and in convincing people and helping people to understand why should I care? And again, we're not focusing on the developers. It's 100% on the people that are writing the RFPs. I need to get into those companies and say, this is why you care. You know, it's your in your financial interest. Um, but that's a, you know, that's a lot of work. Like, think of how long it took us to convince us that organic was a good thing, uh, you know, or fair trade was a good thing. Uh, and we're still doing those efforts. I mean, one of the reasons I don't look at the fair trade not that I don't think it's a good thing. I think fair trade is a great thing. But if you actually dig into fair trade, there's many different certifications for fair trade. It's not just one fair trade. This rainforest is doing it. Uh, there's a USDA sort of one on it. There's a different one. Individual companies do it. Manufacturers have their own fair trade status certification. Like it's still being worked out, and they've been doing it for 20 years, and they still haven't figured out what to do yet. So this is a this is a lot of work over many many many, many years. Um, and you got to get a lot of people on board, but Jacob, I think you've got some some folks pretty excited and ready to yeah. jump in and do some work on this. So definitely make sure you check the chat notes. We do download uh, the chat and the shared notes, uh, so we'll have the next files for those. Uh, All not right. Sure we'll those yet, but we are at the end of our time. Thank you so much for sharing. All right. Thanks, everyone.